Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Med School Tutors webinar on high yield histology for the USMLE and Comlex exams. My name is Dr. Joe Hansen. I've been working with Med School Tutors for about five years now as an individual tutor for basically every exam that exists in medical school. Big emphasis on USMLE and Comlex, obviously. Uh, in that time, I've tutored for somewhere around 6,000 hours for a few hundred students taking their exams. And I'm hoping that I can kind of pivot that experience, that knowledge into showing you guys what matters when it comes to the histology stuff on the exam, which isn't exactly the funnest stuff in the world. I'm joined by Dr. Mike Stevens this evening. Mike, you want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, my name's Mike Stevens. I am, uh, I've been with MST for about, it's hard to believe, over three years now. Uh, and, and I've done um, uh, a lot of tutoring for, again, the whole gamut of uh, exams that you'll take through the course of med school from step one through to even beyond into step three. Um, and uh, and thrilled to thrilled to be here tonight and and uh, talk through maybe not the most exciting topic but definitely a very high yield one and a very important one for uh, for the board exams. All right. Well, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into what we're going to be discussing this evening. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to let you know who we are, Med School Tutors, a little bit as everybody's getting kind of comfortable in their seat there. Med School Tutors is primarily a one-to-one -one online tutoring company. We work primarily with students who are in medical school, but we work with everybody from pre-med through residency. I would wager most students here tonight are not pre-med if they're asking about histology on the board exams, uh, but we do like to work with students longitudinally as they make their way through the entire process of medical education. We have over 15 years working with students online. One of the initial kind of like companies online working with students directly via a web-based interface like this. And we have tons of really talented and really passionate uh, clinicians, students, residents on our service, on our staff, uh, who have all done really, really well on their standardized exams and are hoping to kind of get paired with you guys and potentially work with you in the future if you guys ever need any individual tutoring. So that's us. We'll talk about more, more about MSC later tonight. For now, let's talk about what we're going to do this evening. So this, this session is focused on talking about high yield histology. Main emphasis is going to be on what you're going to look for on exam questions. Histology is not exactly the most fun thing in the world to learn. There's a lot of intricate details for histology that's very difficult to kind of piece together, especially when you're not maybe very interested in going into pathology or something along those lines, maybe uh, with dermatology for Mike in Mike's case. But otherwise, uh, generally speaking, this is something we got to just kind of learn, get through, and then put behind us after we take these exams. The way we're going to do that is to first kind of talk a little bit about exactly what you want to do when you see a histology-based question on the exam, then kind of go through some really high yield stuff that you're likely to encounter when it comes to histology questions questions, moving through a couple of high yield organ systems, cardio, endocrine, GI, and renal. And then we're going to talk a little bit about kind of big picture questions that you would end up seeing on the exam with particular emphasis on what inflammatory processes might look like. And then finally do a couple of practice questions where we deploy the knowledge that we've gained tonight. At the end of our session, we're going to have a live question and answer session. Also, uh, during our session, you'll notice that we've sent a couple messages to you in the chat box there. You can go ahead and respond. Uh, Mike and I are gonna ask for some feedback this evening as we're going through images, kind of asking you guys what you think the answers are, what we're looking at, that kind of thing. Any answers you submit only come to Mike and myself. They don't go to your peers in the audience there. So feel free to just throw some answers out there. The more you interact, it's more helpful for us to see what we're doing here. So if you see Mike or myself kind of gazing over into the corner here, looking at what you guys are chatting to us, uh, please forgive us for not staring straight at the camera the entire time. Uh, so if you guys have any questions throughout our session as well, Feel free to ask questions as we go. We'll try to incorporate into our conversation that we're having this evening. If you have any big picture questions about looking at histology questions or things along those lines, uh, by the end of our session, we'll stick around for a bit to answer any questions you've got. With all that being said, uh, Mike, how are we going to make our approach to looking at histology questions on the exam? Absolutely. Um, so I, what I'll say up front is that it can be a little intimidating when you click next, the next question pops up and you see a picture of a past slide. And our goal is by the end of tonight that you won't feel that way, or at least will feel less that way. And, uh, and I think the most important piece of information to communicate, if there's really one thing that you take away tonight, is really see it as a buzzword in disguise. You know, you, you look through first aid and you see that they give you descriptions of all of these kind of pathognomonic path findings. And this is almost in lieu of that. They won't tell you that they see X, Y, and Z when they look under the microscope, but they'll show you a picture of that. And it's up to you to try to figure out, trying to take the image that's in front of you and, and translate it into the words of the buzzword. And, and so to that, and then what you're gonna be looking for is that the, to this point here, the obvious and pathognomonic findings. Uh, and so you don't have to have, you know, in, in the real world, 
it, we do we actually do a lot of path in, in the in the Durham world. And you know, you have to take the whole picture in, you have to look for multiple diagnoses, you have to make sure you're not missing anything. It can be a very kind of painstaking process, but here it's gonna be there's gonna be one diagnosis, it's gonna be pretty apparent in front of you. And so look for that. The, um, the other aspect of this is that, that good old clinical correlation. And so you will have a picture in front of you. It won't have a caption. It won't have any, you know, it won't necessarily have like a, a context directly paired with it other than the vignette that you have and use that vignette. So you're going to have a, a, a story and that'll give you an idea of where this, this biopsy, this, you know, past specimen might've been taken from if they don't directly tell you. So the, the kind of steps of how to approach this is number one, don't panic. Number two, uh, get an idea of what even you should be expecting to find or what you might be looking for in terms of the tissue of origin. And then, and then number three, you know, what stands out to you immediately? What can you, what your eyes immediately go to is, as the, the kind of buzzword in disguise, if you will. Um, yeah, and so, so to kind of dive in there a little bit and to start our practice here, I'm going to jump in and kind of ask our audience to get involved a little bit. So looking at the slide that we have in front of us, again, this can be really intimidating, especially when we don't get that clinical vignette, but I'm going to kind of test all of you guys a little bit here. If you guys can type into the chat box, what tissue do you think we're looking at right now? With my major hint to you being that the red circle kind of gives us a hint of the kind of material that this organ generally produces. So if you guys can go ahead and just like, give me a guess, anything that comes to mind in terms of what organ you might be looking at just based on the circle territory that we have on this slide. Got a couple answers filtering in here. I'm gonna wait for a couple more before I move on. Oh, am I having a connection issue? Is, uh, are we still good, Mike? Can you hear me? I, I hear you, Joe. Okay, we had one person in the audience that uh, wasn't able to hear me, so I'm sorry for that. Uh, all right, so we've got a couple answers, and the answers I'm seeing so far predominantly are number one, thyroid with colloid material, since it is this Perfect. solid hyaline material. So excellent answer to those students. Other answer choice that I saw here from a couple of people was a kind of a renal biopsy. And I like that idea because there's a solid circular structure here. And you look at that, you're like, maybe that's a glomerulus. In this case, turns out, no, this is more of a pathological picture that we're looking at in the thyroid. And the thing that I want to emphasize about this particular diagram or this slide that's going to be really high yield for the exam is not only are we identifying the tissue of origin by looking at stuff that's around the main center of focus here. So we see that colloid and we say, ah, this might be the thyroid gland. In addition to that, we're also looking at the dead center of the image for the pathognomonic and like intense finding that tells us what our answer is. So now that I've told you that we're looking at the thyroid gland and I'm telling you that it's a pathological picture, this is a disorder or a disease, can anybody tell me what is that in the center of the image for us? And somebody already answered, it's a great job, but a couple more people, give me a guess as to like, what is that structure that's obviously a very different color Maybe it's a little hard to see in this image, but it looks like maybe a circle with multiple circles within it. In this case, maybe something that would be heavily calcified. Any other guesses as to what we might be looking at here? I'll go with the, uh, the one correct guess that we have here. This is a Samoma body that we're looking at in the middle of the image. And this would be the kind of pathognomonic finding that would tell us immediately on the exam what kind of disorder we're looking at. We can tell that we're seeing the thyroid gland based on the colloid material that's there. Keep in mind, the picture on the right side of our screen is not necessarily identical to the picture that we just saw because that's normal thyroid, normal colloid that we're looking at in that image, as opposed to the pathological image that we were looking at where there maybe were more atypical cells. And if we saw that we had a Samoma body in this case, which was what we saw in that previous image, I'm gonna strain you guys just a little bit more, stick with me, it'll get easier after this, I promise. But can anybody tell me what disorder is associated with Samoma bodies? What is the disease that this patient might have in their thyroid gland? And if they have some mobile bodies there. Got one excellent answer so far too. Can I get a third one? Oh, very good. All right, people are nailing it now. So thank you very much for interacting, guys. Really appreciate it. The somoma bodies mean that we're looking at, yes, papillary thyroid cancer. It's also seen in meningiomas and epithelial ovarian cancers. And this would be one of the high yield histological findings that we probably do need to know for the exam because it comes up with a frequency that makes it very relevant for answering questions correctly. Generally, you'll see this kind of lamellated circular picture like we see in the drawing on the right side there that's in the middle of the field that we're looking at. And one thing that I wanna really emphasize here is that the histological images that we'll be looking at today and in general, what you'll be seeing on the exam are not designed to fool you. They're not made to be really mean. They are gonna usually show you the high yield and important findings 
near the middle of the image. In the particular case that we just looked at, it was right in the crosshairs in the middle of the picture because they usually want you to focus on the center of the image. You can find other things like colloid that would tell you it's the thyroid gland in the periphery or in quadrants of the picture, but usually we're not looking at the very edges of the image in order to identify what our diagnosis is. So if we kind of stick with those principles, look towards the middle of the picture for the path amount of finding, identify that finding, kind of find out what organ we're looking at. We can usually answer these questions, maybe even just based on the image alone. I will emphasize though, that the vignette itself is gonna help us in a lot of cases, and we should use these images to clarify the diagnosis that we're coming up with in the vignette. Uh, anything to add about that papillary thyroid stuff, Mike? No, no, I think that's perfect. Uh, and, um, and, and just to drive home that point again, you know, very rarely will the entire question turn on the pathfinding, but you can use it to help support uh, suspected diagnosis. Excellent. I apologize, everybody. I realized I put my mic right in front of my mouse. So if you guys hear clicking throughout the evening, I'm sorry for that. Uh, so Mike, why don't you go ahead and guide us through what we see in this next image here. We're going to kind of pimp our students a little bit on what we're looking at, but like what should they be paying attention to if they saw this type of image uh, on a UWorld question or a ComSec question or something along those lines? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think I might, I think I might kick it off by continuing the, the trend of before and, and challenging guys to, to maybe hazard a guess as to where you think this biopsy came from um, and, and maybe some of the features that tip you off towards that. Uh, cool. and, We've and, got some students already wow. who are starting to answer like what they're seeing here. So awesome job. Um, in particular, I would agree with everybody who's saying muscle here specifically. And one thing that's important about taking a look at this particular set of muscle tissue is that we're seeing that it kind of looks striated, but it's also not necessarily like the typical organization you see the striated muscle. Mm -hmm. We can see individual cells here they're connected together. And generally speaking, if they're going to show you an image like this on the exam, they're probably going to focus more on cardiovascular material. So excellent job to everybody who said this was cardiac muscle that we are looking at here. Now, uh, Mike, when you see cardiac muscle in the exam, like what kind of like warning sign goes off in your head in terms of like what kind of disease process they're typically going to end up asking you about? Yeah, absolutely. They, they love in the context of this, and, and it's not something that is clinically done very often. You don't really biopsy for this condition, but um, if uh, what they what they like to test on is the kind of evolution of myocardial infarction, and I, it is very high yield to have an idea of what the steps are on a histologic level that happen over time in someone who is initially having an MI and as, as their body responds to that insult. Um, you guys did a great job honing in on identifying that this is cardiac muscle. I think just to point out a couple of the salient features that tip you off is, uh, is these little red cells that you're seeing kind of transecting these, these fibers. Um, those represent red blood cells kind of within capillaries that are traversing in between the muscle itself. Uh, another aspect is that whenever you're thinking about muscle, you're often going to see the, the fibers themselves kind of as these, these um, striations. And then the nuclei of any kind of muscle cell is going to be a, a, um, what we call a spindle cell. It's going to have kind of a, an elongated appearance as opposed to the normal round nucleus you might expect for something like a lymphocyte. And so different, um, different types of smooth muscle. So you can have smooth muscle that has the kind of cigar shaped nuclei, but even skeletal muscle and uh, cardiac muscle also kind of copy that, that uh, picture. So I think moving on, yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at a pathological picture. Mike, do you wanna kind of lead the students through what they should be looking for here? Yeah, absolutely. So, so here you kind of compare and contrast what you're, what um, this picture to the previous one. And I think this actually goes to a point that I didn't mention before, but oftentimes when you wanna get a sense of abnormal, you have to have a pretty good sense of, well, what does normal look like? So you can figure out there's, there's something here that wasn't here before. And, um, and so if you compare the blue again, so again, you have those kind of striated, you have those elongated muscle fibers, similar to before, but now there's something more, there's something overlaid on this. You have these, these blue kind of things. Uh, and those are nuclei again, those are, um, those are cells and those are the nuclei of the cells, but they're not like the nuclei of the cardiac myocytes that we saw before, kind of those spindle cells. Uh, they're a little bit rounder, and if you look, if you, if you really squint your eyes and, and kind of believe me, you might hazard that they're a little bit polymorphonuclear or just have the look of what you would expect for inflammatory cells like neutrophils. And so, um, and so what, what, you, what you have here is inflammation into the myocardium, which is not normal. Uh, you should not have an inflammatory response affecting your myocardium. And so you have to wonder why that's happening. And, and it just so happens that, well, I'll, I'll again, turn it to you guys. What do you think 
is happening in this patient's heart that would cause them to have a reaction where there's an infiltration of these inflammatory cells uh, in between the muscle fibers. Um, okay, okay, some good, some good thoughts. Okay, here we, yes. Uh, kind of like the, thought, the, the point that we were bringing up before, this is, this is along the spectrum of the response to injury. We'll, we'll kind of flesh this out fully. Um, some other answer choices that are, that are good thoughts. Endocarditis, um, it would be more of a, uh, you'd expect more of a myocarditis kind of phenomenon to present within the myocardium itself. Um, you wouldn't necessarily expect, you, you could have neutrophils, but the, the inflammatory reaction would be probably more lymphocytes to acidic. Um, but, but great job, guys. This is a kind of response to what you'd expect from necrosis or hypoxia. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll throw in there too, that as far as the kind of histology of the myocardium goes, if we're focusing on what's going to be high yield on the assembly exam, on a complex exam, it's always going to be myocardial infarction. Mm -hmm. um, biopsying the heart directly, as Mike indicated, is not a typical thing to do. And so if you were to obtain this under your microscope, you need to think about this in clinical terms in the same sense that, you know, the heart's a very vital organ, stabbing a needle into it to take a piece of it, mm -hmm. just to look at it underneath the microscope seems a little aggressive. We're going to cause more injury than we're possibly going to spare by doing that. And so you have to ask yourself under what circumstances would we end up getting this picture? And the answer is almost universally on the exam during autopsy. You would take a look at a biopsy of the heart to confirm the diagnosis that you were sus uh, suspicious of in terms of the cause of death in the patient in many cases. And so looking at the biopsy is probably more of an autopsy record in this case. And so as a result, don't think of this in terms of this is what you would do in order to identify myocardial infarction. And furthermore, you probably wouldn't do this for a lot of other cardiac conditions like myocarditis and things of those nature because they would be unlikely to kill the patient outright. And so catching a person who has myocarditis when they die due to inflammatory problems like viral myocarditis, for instance, uh, would be difficult to do uh, under most circumstances. One other point to emphasize here, the exams really, really, really like to put these images on there because they like to march out the timeline that we typically look at when we're looking at myocardial infarctions. And one of the most high yield things that we're gonna run into in terms of like myocardial biopsies is identifying exactly where along the timeline we are. Now we don't have to get too specific with this timeline, but a lot of you, when you're answering this question uh, in the chat box, did an excellent job of identifying that we're probably looking at a person who's coming in within the first couple of days post myocardial infarction, not necessarily within the first few hours, because we, number one, need time for inflammatory, inflammatory infiltrate to get access to the myocardium after a few hours and some cell death has occurred. But this isn't long enough for the heart to have officially died and been replaced by scar tissue and macrophages that would remove the dead tissue. And so the major timeline events that we're going to look at for myocardial infarctions are going to be initial injury where you don't really see any major changes in line microscopy, and then wavy fibers with neutrophilic infiltrate after about a day or so. After a few days, lots of macrophages go in there, start removing tissue. And then finally, after a couple of weeks, you start end up seeing that scar tissue is deposited, which looks relatively pale on the image. And so so if you see myocardial tissue on the biopsy, you should start anticipating, is this like an MI style question? Because that's most likely what they're going to ask about if they're asking about the image itself. Anything to add about that myocardial stuff before we move on, Mike? No, I love that, Joe. I think that all agree on every front. Cool. All right. In that case, then, uh, for our next uh, slide here, uh, oh, just to answer the student uh, who asked in the chat box, this was somewhere around 24 hours uh, to like maybe 72 hours, give or take, in that time frame due to neutrophilic mm -hmm. infiltrate being present with wavy fibers, but not necessarily seeing the fibers being removed or loss of tissue. There's still pretty dense tissue in this area, which means macrophages really haven't gotten to their work, which usually happens within like the first one to two weeks after myocardial infarction. So neutrophilic predominance inside the myocardial tissue typically means somewhere in the first couple of days, but after the first 12 hours or so. Moving on to our next system, I'm going to give you guys a hint here and say that this is an endocrine slide that we're looking at here. Can you guys tell me in the chat box what organ are we likely looking at here? What endocrine organ is this most likely? All right, a couple good answers already. Going to wait to see if anybody else can chime in with some other answers. All right, very good. So thanks for everybody who's 
All right, even more answering for me here. This is the adrenal gland. And importantly, when we're looking at the adrenal gland, what this slide is kind of already pre-hinted to us is that the adrenal gland has multiple different layers to it. And they really like showing this type of picture where you can see the cortex all the way through the glomerulata, the fasciculata, the reticulata, and all the way down to the medulla, which means we're not only looking at the adrenal cortex in this case, in the very middle of the image, we can also see the adrenal medulla, which is more or less an entirely different organ than the adrenal cortex in terms of its function and its structure. So one thing I really want to emphasize about the histology that you'll see here, because this is something that does show up on the exam uh, with a high degree of reliability, is not only do we have three major cellular layers, so our glomerulosa, fasciculata, reticularis, but we also have the medulla, and we have a fifth layer here, which is a little weird that they would include, but the very top layer here, that fifth layer, can anybody tell me what I just pointed to last there. And just to make that very clear, what layer am I pointing to right there? Can anybody answer that? We've got one solid answer so far, I'd like a couple more. At least some guesses. All right. Very good. So thanks guys for playing along here. I'm seeing epithelial, I'm seeing capsule, and you're correct. It is the Cortex is the very surface, and when we say cortex, we want to be careful here because the cortex itself is the three functional layers below this. But generally speaking, we have an epithelial layer that surrounds the adrenal cortex. It doesn't do anything. It's just the skin of the adrenal gland, but they love to label that as answer choice A on the exam. And so if you're looking at this and they're saying, hey, where are glucocorticoids produced from on this image? And we don't include that A is a non-functional layer, we're going to potentially make a mistake and choose the wrong letter, thinking that maybe answer choice A just necessarily means glomerulosa when it does not. So be careful that they love to la label this non-functional territory as uh, a possible answer choice on the exam when they show this to you. Uh, so if we're looking at our adrenal cortex, uh, Mike, do you want to kind of like walk through uh, maybe like the major functionality that we have the, with the adrenal cortex? Like what kind of questions would they ask us where they're including the adrenal cortex or a picture of it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the the outside again is the, the capsule that we talked about that really has really no function, just is there and along for the ride. Uh, and then the mnemonic that you might often come across in textbooks or in your classes is uh, GFR, like glomerular filtration rate. Um, only this time we're talking about layers of the adrenal cortex. So uh, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. Uh, and so um, starting, with the, starting with the top layer, the zona glomerulosa is really the, the one central purpose of this is aldosterone. So we, we think about mineralocorticoids, but in particular aldosterone. So this is where you're going to be secreting aldo. Um, aldosterone is one of the highest yield hormones on this test. It bridges multiple different organ systems from cardiac to renal to endocrine. Uh, when it's um, uh, dysfunctional in some ways, then it can cause significant pathology. Even when it's physiologically being secreted, it can cause considerable issues. Um, and so that is a, a very important one to know kind of inside and out, how it works, why it works. The next layer down is going to be the zona fasciculata. And, and this one is going to be where you're making the glucocorticoids and kind of the, the poster child hormone for the glucocorticoids is cortisol. And so, um, and so you can actually, if you look at the, the cross section of the adrenal cortex, you can kind of make out, again, you have to squint your eyes and believe me a little bit, but you can kind of make out a little bit of a difference where the, the cell types are a little bit lighter they're filled with more of um, more lipid-like material that you would expect for um, for the glucocorticoids, and so that the, you just see a shift in the color that reflects that change from one layer to the next. Another very very high yield hormone, uh, one that spans across multiple different organ systems and causes problems with having too much, having too little. Uh, and then finally, the, the very the last layer of the adrenal cortex, if you will, is the zona reticularis. And this one's not quite as emphasized nearly as much. Um, and this is where you're going to be releasing some of the adrenal um, uh, sex hormones like DHEAS and, and similar kinds of steroid hormones like that. Uh, not as high yield as its um, uh, upstairs neighbors, but um, still nevertheless an important one that you need to be able to identify just so that you don't miss it as a distractor um, and can identify it in a, in a lineup. And then the, the 
Very innermost layer, the adrenal medulla, um, is going to be where you're secreting the catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine. And, you know, remember, these are more neuroendocrine in origin. These are going to be um, uh, releasing, you know, they're, they're neurally controlled, but they release hormones. And, and so a lot of times those kinds of cells are going to be kind of like the, the very blue, very small and very blue. And that's a tip off that you kind of, again, moved into a new part of the adrenal uh, going from the cortex into the innermost layer. Um, do you have anything else you would add about, uh, about how to break that down? No, that's excellent. I think you did an excellent job walking through those. And uh, one of the reasons we're belaboring talking about the just general appearance of these things is that when you're looking at the adrenal cortex, as far as the exam goes, it's fairly unlikely that they're going to give you a histological image that represents pathology when it comes to the adrenal cortex. They're much more likely to give you a picture that represents just a normal physiologic picture of what it looks like, and then ask you some kind of physiological question based on function thereafter. So they might give you a question, say, saying that a patient comes in with the symptoms of hyperaldosteronism. And then they would ask which layer is responsible primarily for producing the hormone in question. And then you'd have to choose between glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. And each of these layers would be labeled on a histologic diagram. So the kind of nice thing here is that there's not too many images of pathology that they will show you for histology of the general cortex, but it behooves us then to be really good at remembering the three different functional layers we're going to see here, the capsular layer, and then also keep in mind, they could end up pointing an arrow all the way down to the bottom in the area that you would least suspect down here at the adrenal medulla, and then ask you some questions about uh, what type of hormones would be produced there. Specifically, we're talking about catecholamines now, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Um, so just to kind of like keep everything flowing before we take a look at our next image, can anybody tell me what would be the neurotransmitter that would stimulate the adrenal medulla? So this is a really tricky question. I know I'm being a little unfair here because it's not pure histology, but that is what this question would do to you in you world. They would say, here's your labeled area, the area with the arrow, what does it produce? Or sorry, what stimulates, excuse me, my question. And excellent job from everybody. Ooh, I'm very impressed. Lots of acetylcholine answers. And we produce epinephrine as a result of stimulating with acetylcholine in this area. I apologize for uh, tangling my words there a little bit. So excellent job, everybody. Uh, so uh, key takeaway here then is that we're primarily going to end up seeing uh, that they're going to ask questions about the normal appearance and the functional histology that we see thereof. Now, moving on to our next system here. This one is no longer an endocrine system, but can anybody tell me in the chat box, uh, what is the organ that we might be looking at here? Or maybe what system is this organ in? I'll be a little bit fair there. Where did we get this biopsy from? Can anybody tell me? Excellent answers. Very good. Ooh, dead on with somebody. Mm -hmm. So th this is GI tract for sure, because we can see that we've got these kind of like up and down rugated appearance here that you'd usually end up seeing with the stomach and glandular tissue underneath. This is the stomach specifically, and this would be gastrointestinal histology that we're looking at in this case. So uh, when we're looking at gastrointestinal histology, one key thing to point out is that there are many, many different cells that are represented in this image. And this is a, honestly one of the more frightening things to come across when you start doing your practice assessments and when you're looking at your world and one of these things happens to pop up because when you see a histological image that looks like this, and they point an arrow in the middle of it and they say, what cell is this uh, that we're pointing to? This can become a real mess because we've got many different types of cells that are represented in this territory. So uh, I'm gonna ask you guys a question to lead into what the most important thing is here. Which of the available cells, this was multiple choice, so I want you guys to uh, all try to answer this one. Which of these cells produces gastric acid? All right, got some answers rolling in. You've basically got five or six answer choices there to choose from, so everybody try to guess. A few more answers typed in, and then we'll move on. All right, I'll take what I can get. Very good. I like the people putting question marks at the end of their answer to suggest the lack of confidence. The answer is 
parietal cells. So if we're looking at the cells that are available over on the side here, one thing I want to emphasize is that parietal cells are probably the most important cells that you're going to see in gastric histology. There is a possibility that chief cells might be mentioned from time to time, but for the most part, parietal cells are the ones that they care about when it comes to gastric function. Not only do they produce gastric acid, but they also produce one, or they actually help to absorb one vital nutrient. Can anybody tell me which vitamin parietal cells help us to absorb. All right, Ooh, now we're nailing it. Okay, good, thank you for the answer. So B12, yes, we need intrinsic factor produced by parietal cells to absorb B12. Plenty of questions can ask you about megaloblastic anemia. Alternatively, we're producing gastric acid from parietal cells, so that's another vital function that they perform. So when we're looking at our histology of the stomach tissue, if they point out a specific cell for us to pay attention to, it is virtually guaranteed that we are going to end up seeing either parietal cells or chief cells labeled. For the most part, parietal cells can be identified as being relatively large with centrally located nuclei. And then generally speaking, they have a more pale appearance to their cytoplasm than any of the other cells located in the gastric glands. So if they were to point an arrow at a cell that is suspiciously large, and maybe in some cases even has kind of the shape of having like little invaginations in it, uh, where we secrete the gastric acid from, that would indicate to us that we're looking at a parietal cell most likely. And any question about the functionality of gastric acid, intrinsic factor, B12 absorption, or anything along those lines, almost certainly would be referring to gastric parietal cells. And so as a result, if we see any questions that are asking about uh, some kind of uh, gastric pathology and what appears to be normal gastric mucosa, I would lean towards the possibility of them asking about B12, gastric acid, something along those lines. Okay, so uh, with that being said, uh, Mike, be ready to lead us through our next uh, pathological picture here. Let's do it. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at our next slide here. So let's go for it, Mike. Uh, lead our students through what we should be looking for here. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I will... Um... I will start off by if if anyone thinks they they already out of the gate have an idea of, of where let's start with where this could be coming from, um, and then if you want to hazard a guess as to what it might be, if there's anybody that's feeling feeling brave. All right, wow, I'm very impressed. All right, great, great. So, um, I think. Starting off with where this is coming from, a, a couple of people chimed in with uh, intestinal or, or variations on that. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Um, and so when you look at this image here, what you see is these uh, almost, it kind of almost looks glandular in some way, these, you know, uh, spaces, these lumina that are kind of surrounded by what looks like an epithelium and then secretion into that. And, and these represent Crips. And so kind of the opening space in the middle is kind of the lumen. And then you have um, some uh, what looks like mucin and things like that being uh, collected inside. Um, and so we're within, you know, what we would typically expect is if we're in the intestines, you'll see some projections outward and then you'll see some projections downward too. And that's what represents the Crips. Uh, and so, so to, to restate it then, think, think intestines. Okay, and we see Crips. What, what is missing in this picture? And I kind of referenced it before, you know, you have these projections downward and they're complemented by, normal, normally you'd have what in the small intestines, kind of the almost opposite of the use. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect, excellent. Um, so a few people chimed in villi. And so villi are going to be, the projections upward into the, the lumen of the, the larger small intestines above. So to kind of uh, orient you guys so you have an idea of um, where we're at, the again, the, the lumen is going to be directed upward. And so it's the, it's the space at the top. And so you'd normally have projections that would go, finger-like projections that would go up at the top here. And we don't see that, we don't have that. Um, and so, and, and don't worry if you don't know the answer, it's no, there's no stress in this. It's very, um, very low stakes here. 
Uh, and if anything, it gives us an opportunity to teach something. So that's that's one finding that we're kind of associating with this condition that we're thinking about is, is loss in this case of intestinal villi. With that piece of information, great, great. So people are already kind of honing in now on, on what the diagnosis is. Uh, the, um, the next aspect of this, a couple of other things that you can see. So the crypts actually here are pretty big. This is an, an entity that you'd call crypt hyperplasia. So you have a combination of loss of intestinal villi, epidur you know, the epithelial atrophy and loss of those villi, crypt hyperplasia. And then you're just seeing a lot of inflammation in the, the top layer here. And in particular, I just wanna point out, you know, histology is tough. I think there's always a motivation to want to, to zoom in and see higher power and, and you know, get closer up. And oftentimes you don't need to do that. You can get a lot of information from just a low power view. Um, and that's something that pathologists really like to drive home. You know, you kind of sometimes miss the forest for the trees when you're just too close to the, to the um, cells. But those little blue dots that are just kind of peppered over the slide, just kind of all over the place. Just taking a step back, you see tons of little blue dots. Those are lymphocytes. Um, and that's a key feature of, of this entity. You have what are called intraepithelial lymphocytes. And so it's that combination, perfect. Thank you, Joe. Those, the, the combination of intraepithelial lymphocytes, crypt hyperplasia, and intestinal atrophy that, that kind of gets you. I'll give a little bit more time if anyone else wants to chime in. I think a lot of people over the course of my little monologue have, uh, have come up with the right answer, but this is a good picture for celiac disease. Super, super high yield, very, very important. And they love this pathfinding, they love this clinical entity. Yeah, I was so just, to say, oh, go ahead, yeah. Well, yeah, it, um, just, to, just to show here in kind of the cartoon format and reemphasize those points, then you get the flattening of the villi, you get the intraepithelial lymphocytes, and you get that, that crypt hyperplasia. So there's long crypts that, that extend further down than you would normally expect. Yeah, and I'll simply emphasize what Mike had mentioned before. The trick here is to recognize that we're looking at intestinal tissue. And even if we don't know exactly where the intestinal tissue is located, the fact that we can kind of pick out that we're looking at some kind of villi, but that those villi aren't really like projecting outwards into the intestinal space. They're kind of overshadowed by this swollen, inflamed tissue. And furthermore, there's a bunch of blue dots all over the place. Those blue dots in any tissue at any time generally mm -hmm. means that we're looking at like some kind of lymphocytic infiltration, or maybe in the case of the myocardial tissue we're looking at before, some kind of neutrophilic in infiltration. But it's usually infiltration by white blood cells that we're looking at when we see tons of blue dots, all those little nuclei all over the place usually are not going to be there in normal healthy tissue. And so whenever you see those little speckled dots like pepper over the picture that we're looking at on that celiac disease slide there, that's going to tell us that we're looking at somebody who's got inflammation in that tissue. And that could mean that we have maybe infection in that space. Or alternatively, it could mean that we have autoimmune inflammation, as would be the case in celiac disease. I'll emphasize too that we're being a little unfair when we just show you these slides and say, hey, what do we got? We do want you to start to recognize, well, that's inflammation and that's probably intestinal tissue, so inflamed intestinal tissue. But without a clinical vignette, it's very difficult to identify where we are. And we're being especially unfair too, because in truth, when you do send pathological slides, to a pathologist, if you don't tell them the tissue of origin and you just give them some tissue and ask them to figure it out, you will get an angry letter back from the pathologist asking you to identify where you got that tissue from. Even the professionals who look at these slides all the time are gonna want some kind of clinical context under which you receive that tissue so they can better identify what they're looking at. So we're making this as hard as possible to show you that there are some clues that we can pick up just from the image itself, even if this usually isn't the only way that we're gonna answer these questions when we see them on the exam. Um, so one question that we're getting from a student here is, okay, well, how do we like differentiate neutrophils from lymphocytes? In this particular case, you probably would not. There's not really any easy way to determine that we're looking at lymphocytes per se, other than to know the celiac disease itself, the diagnosis that we've come to is usually a lymphocytic infiltrate. However, if you were able to identify that you have multi-lobed nuclei, if we were just maybe a little bit more zoomed in per chance, then you'd be able to say, oh, well, the like, you know, three lobes of the nucleus in a white blood cell usually means a neutrophil. So those segmented nuclei would help you to identify that if we were a little bit closer in, which we kind of were in the cardiac picture, but not necessarily in this case, a little bit lower magnification which means we don't need to know the difference, right? If we can't know the difference, we don't need to know the difference. Um, 
one other question we're getting is, are these the exact images we might see in step one? Well, not exact exact, because I can't, I don't have access to step one's actual images. So I can't claim that we're looking at something that would show up exactly on the exam. But these specific conditions and a picture or a biopsy from another patient with the same condition, all of these things are very high yield and can show up on the board exams for sure. Uh, one way that you can verify this yourself too, is to recognize the things that are very commonly represented either in first aid or UWorld or other question banks, even if you're utilizing them like AMBOSS or uh, maybe uh, uh, the ComBank question bank as well. If you're seeing that they're giving you histological slides at all in those, uh, in those practice questions, those high yield materials, it's likely that it could show up on the exam in that case. We're not necessarily gonna take uh, low yield microscopic images and put them in the rarefied space of the kind of the study materials. So if you're ever in doubt of like whether something's high yield or not in terms of histological appearance, if it's in one of those major re review resources like UWorld or First Aid, it probably could show up on the exam within reason. Um, so moving on from this, uh, taking a look at our next kind of like high yield organ system here. Uh, next question for you guys. What are we looking at in this slide? What is this? All right, we got one, two, three solid answers. Very good, keep them coming. All right, so I'm seeing kidney glomerulus. Excellent answers. I got a nephron answer in there too. I'll take it technically because the glomerulus is one half of the nephron. So we're looking at a picture of a glomerulus here. And here's my extra special bonus question to you guys. This is a normal picture. This is just renal histology that we're looking at. What disease could this be though? If I were to show you this, I said, this is from a person who has renal pathology. This is somebody who's sick. What disease would this be? All right, some good answers in here. Maybe a couple more people take a guess. All right, I'll take it. So this could be minimal change disease. The name minimal change means that when you look at the light microscopy picture, you're going to end up seeing minimal changes from what the normal picture would show us. So kind of intuitive name. I kind of like it, what they did there. And the basic idea is that typically if you have like a young kid coming in with the phrotic syndrome, uh, minimal change disease would be maybe like a post viral inflammation that we sometimes see in young kids' kidneys. And so you have a kid coming in with like swelling of their face and their limbs, kind of an anisarchic picture with tons of proteinuria. You do your light microscopy picture and then you end up getting just the normal picture. You probably have minimal change in that case. This isn't to say that we would biopsy every child's kidneys if they were to come in with swelling. We would probably presume they have minimal change in many cases and empirically treat them with steroids or something of that nature. However, if they do a biopsy, this is the, probably the picture that you would end up seeing in that case. So I mean that to say that it's entirely possible that if we do a renal biopsy, that we could end up getting a normal appearance and yet still have a actual pathological condition occurring. And so don't take it for granted that when we look at a picture on the exam of a glomerulus, that it necessarily has to be pathological or rather it doesn't necessarily have to have any key findings in it. It could be simply a normal glomerulus. So don't start chasing shadows looking at a normal glomerulus saying, am I looking at like, you know, these like Kimmelson Wilson nodules here? Am I seeing like some kind of membranous problem happening? If it looks normal, it probably is normal in appearance. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at a high yield image that they really like to show us on the exam for the kidney stuff. Uh, Mike, you want to kind of walk us through this one? Yeah, absolutely. So this is, uh, this is a little different from all the other slides that we looked at. Instead of pink and blue, we have green and yellow this time. Um, and so what we're looking at here is this is immunofluorescence. This is where they are using an antibody to identify either other antibodies or deposition of substances into the glomerulus of the kidney. And then that, that um, antibody is tagged with something that will light up. I love it. Everyone's already, already knows where this is going. And there are really only two... Um, really two entities that you need to differentiate in terms of thinking about, not two entities, but two, your, your branch point kind of goes in two to three different directions, depending on if you're a lump or a splitter or how you like to divide things. Um, but you want to figure out the, the kind of contour of how the antibody is fluorescing, how the, how the fluorescence is happening. 
And, and specifically what I mean by that is, is it a nice uh, linear kind of ribbon, like a, like a continuous kind of ribbon that's draped over the glomerulus, or does it look like there are areas that are a little bit more clustered, maybe areas that are a little bit less clustered, almost like little grains of sand that are kind of scattered around. And so that's really how you differentiate the two central patterns of immunofluorescence, at least from a kidney standpoint. Uh, and so a, a couple of people have already chimed in, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll open it up to the, to the group in general. Do you guys think that this is a linear process or do you think this is the other, the alternative, the granular process? Perfect. All right, we got a lot of votes for linear and that's perfect. That, the granular process again, we'll show you an example, but it would just be a little bit more, um, I don't mean to be circular about it, but granular, I just have more, more of a sand-like appearance kind of scattered throughout. And so what do you guys think about as kind of the, the pathognomonic disease entity that's associated with a linear immunofluorescence? Great, great, it's already, people are already chiming in. Excellent. You guys have it. This, so this is anti-glomerular basement membrane disease or what, what um, the eponym is good pastures disease. And so kind of to, to flesh that out a little bit more, it's, uh, it's an antibody against um, the alpha three subunit of type four collagen, if you really wanna get specific. And that subunit is present in the glomerular basement membrane and it's present in the pulmonary capillaries. And so the clinical features that you would expect for this entity would be a combination of a glomerulonephritis, patients might have hematuria, kidney failure, and, uh, and pulmonary involvement. So they can have any, it can be a whole spectrum of how bad the pulmonary involvement is, but it can be quite fulminant and lead to diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, they can, bad hemoptysis, they can go into ARDS. Uh, and so it, um, it, it kind of is a little bit of a spectrum in terms of how badly both the organs are affected, but those are the two central organs to think about. Um, when you guys, this is a little bit of a kind of read my mind question, but would, would you think of this as a good thing or a bad thing? Like what would, what would you expect the prognosis for something like good pastures to be? How, how worried? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. In all capital letters, bad. Exactly. So this is not, this is not good. You need to shut this down fast. And so, um, and so oftentimes patients who have very bona fide, you know, it can cause a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. Um, it can um, really, you know, lead to severe kidney damage, lung damage. And so, you know, you're looking at things like cyclophosphamide, plasmapheresis, pulse dose steroids, you need, to, you need to get ahead of this quickly. And so again, just to, to, to circle back to the points that we're bringing up before, um, the, uh, the ribbon-like appearance of the immunofluorescence, and then because this is the cause of rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, you can see that, that crescent, that, that kind of famous crescentic glomerulonephritis. And so if you look here, you can kind of see, um, oh, I used a red marker I shouldn't have. Um, but if you can see my marker there, kind of outlining this, this collection of stuff around the glomerulus, that is all fibrin and inflammatory stuff, cells and debris that's kind of encircling into the area. And that's going to be, um, that's going to be concerning that you need to, again, you need to shut this down quickly. Um, awesome, Jim. I want to add on to that. Um, this is something I sometimes point out too. I didn't choose this, the most ideal picture here uh, in terms of looking at the linear immunofluorescence part, but you can kind of see how there is a crescentic aspect to like the heaped up material that isn't lighting up around the linear immunofluorescence that we're seeing there. So the immunofluorescence that we're seeing this picture covers most of the actual functional glomerulus, but we see a shadow or a dark area where we have that kind of heaped up tissue that does not show up on immunofluorescence there. So the kind of freebie that we get from this is that when we have good pasture syndrome, we're gonna end up seeing that we have a crescentic glomerulonephritis where there's a bunch of junk on the outside pushing in on the glomerulus essentially on the light microscopy picture. And this is kind of important because one thing that we wanna kind of posit here is that identification of every different type of pathological finding on histology for the kidney is a very large laundry list. It's a little overwhelming to try to learn all of that stuff as you're staring step one or level one down. And so generally speaking, 
if you're looking for like how to get the most points out of step one when it comes to just learning the core material, if we know that good pastures is the only linear amino fluorescence finding and that that one specifically gives us the crescentic glomerulonephritis or a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis picture, that automatically sets aside any of these images as specifically being one answer. So we're ready for it essentially. So the point that we're getting at here is that if we tie this crescentic glomerulonephritis to the linear amino fluorescence, now one of the highest yield things that shows up on the exam when it comes to microscopy of the kidney is gonna end up uh, being really easy for you to snag no matter what presentation they give you since we've tied all of these things together. Um, cool, Mike, anything else to say about the linear amino fluorescence before we move on? No, no. Cool. I'll simply point out that as far as like the granular appearance goes, it's kind of like a spray paint picture or kind of just like dots everywhere. It's really important to emphasize that the difference here in terms of why we're seeing linear versus granular is that in the linear amino fluorescence, you have antibodies just straight up lining up in a row along the basement membrane. Whereas with the granular amino fluorescence, these are random meteors of immune complexes just bombarding random spots throughout the glomerular basement membrane, which means that you get kind of like a peppered appearance where it looks like random areas have been hit harder than other areas. Obviously, the third type of amino fluorescence would be none negative, which would mean that we're looking at maybe like a uh, minimal change disease or something like that, which would not show up on our amino fluorescence here. But the key distinction to make is that linear is IgG antibodies lining up, whereas granular is immune complexes depositing. That's the difference that's gonna help us to identify what's going on there. So um, taking a look at our kind of like last major topic for the evening, one thing I kind of wanna uh, really make sure that we drive home these are four different pathological processes that we're looking at in four different slides. So I wanna walk through these just really quickly one by one to do our best to kind of say like where we are. So if we're looking at our first image in the top left, what tissue do you think we're looking at? So in the chat box here, what tissue do you think this is given the arrows that I'm pointing out here? All right, ooh, I got, I got an interesting answer from a student. Uh, let me get a couple more people. Go ahead and just throw a guess out there. What are we looking at when we have this solid pink material in the middle of the tissue, this kind of colloid-like material that we might've talked about earlier in the evening? All right, good. A couple more answers filtering in now. So this is thyroid that we're seeing here. Now this isn't a healthy thyroid because there's a lot of weird stuff going on on the right side of the image in particular, but I can see areas where there's pockets of colloid and that is that like flat, placid kind of hyaline material that looks crystal clear. That's almost always gonna be thyroid when I'm seeing that. So that looks like thyroid tissue. Uh, what if I were to look at the image in the bottom left? What organ or system are we looking at in the picture in the bottom left? All right, very good. We got intestine, GI, GI, very good. So that's gonna be gastrointestinal, probably some of our intestinal tissue, maybe, you know, maybe the ileum or something like that. What about our top right picture? What are we looking at? What organ is this? Good, good, all right, good. So this is getting easy for some of you guys. You're saying like, we're looking at a glomerulus in this picture. So we're looking at the kidney. So there's some key things that are helping me to identify like what organs I'm looking at, right? We have our colloid that tells us we're looking at the thyroid. We have our gastrointestinal system that has those villi. We have our renal system that has a glomerulus. Uh, the last one, uh, I don't, I don't know if that's fair in terms of like not telling you what the clinical vignette is. So I'll simply point out that this last one is a very diseased adrenal cortex that we're, oh, wow, somebody got it. Okay. So good job. Wow. So very diseased adrenal cortex. There's no way you need to pick that out on the exam cold, but here's my big picture question. What similarity do all of these tissues have? They all are undergoing pathology but what's the similarity between them? What's happening to all of them that makes them diseased? All right, I like the answers I'm seeing so far. Keep them coming. Any guesses here? Like what is the pathology? I'm seeing blue dots. I'm seeing 
inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. It says in the slide, it says inflammatory processes. This is inflammation that we're seeing with white blood cell infiltrates. You see the blue dots in all these pictures. These are all pictures of pathology secondary to white blood cells rushing in. And this could be maybe in some cases like infection perhaps, but in many cases, what you're gonna find with the endocrine material is that it's probably autoimmune. It's kind of hard to get an infection like in the thyroid per se, but it is easy to cause autoimmune attack there. And I'll point this out too. On the exam, one autoimmune endocrinopathy begets another. So if they were to tell you on the exam that a person's coming in with type one diabetes and they're now starting to experience cold intolerance and weight gain, thyroid issues, you would say to yourself, ooh, well, that could be autoimmune thyroiditis that we're seeing in that case. Or if they started coming in complaining of like fatigue and weight gain, you might say, oh, maybe it's autoimmune adrenalitis in that case. So in autoimmune gastritis, maybe they have like some kind of dyspepsia or digestion problems, or maybe they're starting to develop megaloblastic anemia. The point being that if they have one autoimmune problem, one organ, it's very possible for the immune system to attack another endocrine organ. There's a lot of overlap in those disease processes. And that goes for family members too. So if they say that there's a family member that has say Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, you would say, oh, well, this patient then has a higher likelihood of Addison's disease or autoimmune adrenalitis. I really like that a student pointed out that the first one here might actually be a lymph node. Excellent eye, because this is going to be a germinal center because in Hashimoto's, which is the top left picture, credit to the other student who said that, uh, this is what we're going to end up seeing where so many white blood cells are going in there. They take up residence in the thyroid gland and become kind of like almost lymphoid tissue in the thyroid gland. Uh, so this is why you would end up saying uh, this is a lymphocytic thyroiditis. That's the other name for Hashimoto's. So excellent job to the student who said not only is this inflammation, but it almost looks like lymphoid tissue because it kind of is now is what we're going to see there. So the driving force I want to point out here is that if you see a bunch of blue dots in the tissue, you could have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. You could have celiac. You could have maybe some kind of like lymphocytic problem in the kidney, um, kind of like a chronic uh, uh, interstitial nephritis in this case, most likely. And then you could have autoimmune adrenalitis as well if you have a bunch of blue dots in the middle of the adrenal gland. So blue dots, inflammation, and you can identify what tissue you're looking at for like their core features. Renal tissue with glomeruli, thyroid is gonna have uh, that colloid in there. Intestines will have their villi kind of hard to identify the adrenal gland. So it's a little mean for me to throw that in there, but possible as well. Uh, anything to add to the inflammatory stuff, Mike, before we move to a couple practice questions? No, no, I think that's, I think that's perfect. Uh, these are all very high yield entities, uh, each of them. And I wish we could spend another hour fleshing all of them out, but, um, but at least picking them out in a histologic slide, that's, these are all the tools that you need. Yeah. All right. So Mike, I'm going to pitch it to you to take us through a practice question here. All right. All right. I'll, um, so what, what I like to do often is, is again, to the point before, you know, we, we hit next on our, on our question deck and this comes up and you see the past slide and, uh, and step one is don't panic. We, you've got it now. You can do this. Uh, you may not know where this is coming from. You may not know what's necessarily going on here and that's okay because we have a clinical context. So what I would say is maybe ignore the picture for the time being. Sometimes you can look at the picture and immediately figure out where they're going with things, but if you can't, that's okay. I'm a big proponent of, I like to start with the question, at least just to get an idea of, of where, where they might be going with things. And so, um, so I'm gonna start there. The patient most likely sustained the MI. Okay, so patient had an MI, that's already, we're, we're given that information. I'm gonna immediately start thinking about cardiac things and assume that this is probably cardiac tissue. Um, during which of the following time frames prior to his death. And then we have some lists of times. And so this is going harkening right back to the point that we brought up before about the, the high yield stuff that it comes that comes with cardiac pathology is uh, associating the, the findings on autopsy of what's happening in someone's myocardium um, relative to the time after the, the myocardial infarction happened. And so taking it from the top, an autopsy, just like we expected, is being performed on a 68-year-old man with history of MI. And then we're given light microscopy of his left ventricle. So in this case, we don't need to know where it's coming from. We're told this is left ventricle. This is the cardiac myocardium. And now this time, what, what I see, and, and so I, I will ask you guys, if you guys want to take a chance at, at what you think the answer might be, I think a couple of people have already put in some answers. All right. 
All right. Got a little bit of a spread here. Uh, a, a couple of votes for, it seems like B has not been a very popular answer, but otherwise we've, we've had a little bit across the board. So what I'm seeing here, just to describe it, is you, you kind of, you have a couple of those, those, those muscle fibers that we were, we were pointing out before, but you know, do they, do they look healthy? Do they look like the normal muscle fibers we saw before? And, and I'd argue that they really don't. They, they don't look very healthy. Um, you don't have as much of the cell nuclei that you had seen in the previous image. And then they're, they're really interrupted by a lot of this other pink stuff. And the other pink stuff, it doesn't look like muscle. It doesn't look like the normal kind of appearance of muscle. Kind of has a little bit of a wispier look to it. And this is collagen. And what happens is that um, if you have, uh, you know, when you have that response to injury over time, you kind of clean everything up. And, and what, what is left behind in the debris of, in the, in the rubble of what's been, what, what's been cleaned up is, is collagen, is scar, is, is fibrosis. So this is, a, this is fibrotic myocardium. Um, and so that takes a long time. You have to make this collagen. You have to, you have to have, you have to go through the whole process of cleaning it up. You have to have fibroblasts come in, myofibroblasts come in to contract things down. You have to have depth you have synthesis and then deposition of this. So whenever you're thinking about a scar-like process, think about think about time exactly. So, so um, so E would be more or less the answer that you'd be looking for here. Is is something on a, on the longest time frame that you're given? It's more than two months. Awesome, excellent job to those who answered answer choice E. I like to see that everybody avoided answer choice B because we showed what answer choice B looked like earlier. And so this question would be a pivot from that to say, hey, what else could they show us in terms of like the picture for the myocardium here? And so I like that a lot of students went for A because we don't see a lot of inflammatory cells in here. And we would normally anticipate that after about a day or so, anywhere in that like, you know, first week to two weeks, probably would see a lot of inflammatory cells in the area that just underwent ischemia infarction. Answer choice A would not show that stuff because we don't have enough time for the cells to have actually died and to have recruited inflammatory materials at that point. Uh, but if we're looking at this picture, not seeing inflammatory materials, but also saying that ain't normal myocardium, probably got to be further out into the future. So we were a little tricky with this question since we hadn't shown you this picture before. So good job to those who were able to kind of see through the lines that are so our best answer here is more than two months. This is scar tissue that we're looking at. Great job, Mike. I'm going to go ahead and uh, take my own question here. So starting from the bottom again, we see a picture. We know we're looking at a kind of like histological image and they tell us the fluorescence areas in the slide are most likely to indicate the presence of which of the following. So we know it's fluorescent and this is what type? There's two types. We looked at one of them. What type of fluorescence are we seeing here? I already got one answer in here, but let's see some more. What do you guys think? What type of immunofluorescence are we seeing in this renal biopsy in this case? Yeah, it's got to be one or the other. So excellent job for everybody who's saying granular. All right, so we know we're looking at granular immunofluorescence. Let's do our due diligence and read through the vignette because we need clinical correlation here. So they tell us we have a 10-year-old boy who's brought to the office by his mother due to facial puffiness and leg swelling. Doesn't really help me because edema is going to be a feature of all kidney disorders in children. There's always going to be proteinuria of some amount, whether it's nephrotic or nephritic syndrome. His mother reports that the patient has been easily fatigued with dark urine for the last 24 hours. So that helps me a little bit. He was treated for a skin infection two weeks ago, but is otherwise healthy. Mm, so what do you guys think the diagnosis is here? Before we go and look at the answer, because you guys are starting to get ahead of ourselves, like what's our diagnosis in this person? Like what did he have? Uh, or what does he have now because he previously had a skin infection? All right, good. I'm seeing a lot of acronyms here for post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Most likely we're going to end up seeing that this kid had some kind of streptococcal infection, impetigo something, or something of that nature, and they received antibiotics for that. I'll point out that uh, minimal change disease would never show us immunofluorescence, so it can't be minimal change, even though a swollen kid does initially sound like minimal change, especially if they had infection recently, but it's usually viral infection. It'll lead to minimal change. Whereas mm -hmm. we know that if we used, uh, if we treated for a skin infection, it's most likely the case that uh, we use antibiotics. And we can read between the lines and say this is probably PSGN based on the image, the fluorescence. Just going through the rest, his vaccinations are up to date. His current blood pressure is hypertensive for an adult, which is a feature of nephritic syndrome. So I'm even more favoring PSGN at this point. And physical exam shows periorbital edema, mild pitting edema along the ankles as we've already noted in their history, remainder of the exam shows no abnormalities, and then they show us a representative renal biopsy in the image. So 
for those of you who have not answered, here's your chance to put the answer in before we uh, move on to show you the answer. And yes, the answer is most likely complement C3 is what we're seeing here, because as we mentioned before, it's not antibodies lining up as in linear immunofluorescence. What we're going to end up seeing in the case of granular immunofluorescence is immune complexes. Now notice in this case, just by knowing that, we automatically had the answer once we saw it was granular. We didn't actually have to get to the diagnosis. But if we didn't immediately know that, we could have leaned on our clinical knowledge to say, oh, well, if this person had post-streptococcal myelonephritis based on their clinical background, this is most likely a kind of immune complex mediated disorder. And so we can get to the answer either clinically or through the image. The image isn't always necessary to come to the diagnosis, especially if it's a particularly foreign image that you're not very familiar with. Go ahead and give it a shot and try to answer it anyway, using your clinical knowledge. There's many, in many cases, multiple paths to success of these questions. Maybe we've kind of supplemented and buffered one of those paths by showing you some pictures. Uh, but if not, if you run into something that you're not familiar with, still give it your best shot because you might be able to answer it even if it does look very scary. Keep in mind, if you study really hard and it looks really scary, it probably looks really scary to everybody else taking the exam too, so you're probably not alone. So just keep working hard because you might be able to answer it correctly. That's our last question for this evening. Uh, we're still here for a few minutes to answer any questions that you guys might have. If you guys want to go ahead and type any questions to us about stuff we talked about this evening or general questions about histology on the exam or the exam itself, feel free to type those into the chat right now. As you guys are maybe thinking of some questions, I'll kind of wrap up really quickly by telling you a little bit more about med school tutors and who we are before we answer those. So just to reiterate, Med School Tutors is primarily a one-to-one -one tutoring company that works to pair uh, medical students, residents, even fellows and attendings uh, like Mike and myself with students like yourself who are looking for a one-to-one -one mentorship program. Uh, generally speaking, we're really helping students to perform their best on standardized exams predominantly, but a lot of what we do too is helping students to prepare for clinical rotations or prepare for applying to residency, putting together personal statements, things of that nature. Um, many students that I've worked with in the past I've stayed in contact with for months and sometimes years after working with them, which is really nice to you know see my step one students move off to go to residency and see the completion of that chapter of their lives. And uh, for that reason, we generally consider ourselves to be mentors to the students that we're working with and really develop long-term relationships in many cases. And so if you're looking for somebody that might be able to help empower you to be the best medical student or the best resident that you can be, we encourage you to reach out and find your own pairing with somebody who kind of like meets your needs and helps to make you the best clinician that you can be. Also, though, if you're not necessarily, uh, you know, looking to dive in and, you know, pair with somebody for a long time, you just want a little bit of advice towards one exam, we also do one time sessions to kind of like organize schedules and study strategies and things of that nature. So if there is anything you guys would be interested in that you could gain uh, from an expert like Mike or myself or our colleagues, uh, feel free to reach out to med school tutors. Our communication information is right up here on the screen. Uh, also, we sent a little survey link to you in the chat there. So if you guys would spend maybe 30 seconds uh, responding to our survey, let us know how we did, give us some feedback so we can know maybe how to improve something like this for next time. We'd really appreciate it. It takes less time than it would take for you to answer one URL question. So thanks uh, for giving us some of that feedback. Um, so we're gonna open up the floor to any questions you guys might have. I know for histology, which is a very hard science-like type thing, it's kind of difficult to ask philosophical questions. But if you guys have any questions whatsoever about anything we talked about tonight, uh, go ahead and shoot it our way. Um, it's okay if you don't have them though in this case. Mike, have you noticed anything that anybody said that maybe we should share? I think any of the content-related questions as we went through, I, I, I you know, we did our best to try to address. If, if anything slipped through the cracks, feel free to, to chime in now. Um, I think one question that did come up just now is, are there, is there a lot more of histology that we need that, you know, so uh, uh, the question is, is there a lot more histology than what we talked about tonight? And, um, and, and I'll say that it's not, you know, the truth is we can't be fully comprehensive in the hour that we have and, and path path in general is far more than you could ever talk about in an hour. Uh, there are, you know, there are organ systems that we didn't get through. You're going to have to recognize some neuropath findings uh, there's going to be some palm and, and other, you know, liver and things like that. So, so the short answer is, um, is no, we did, we did do our best to try to highlight some of the most high yield things. So, you know, recognizing that, that GI path, the adrenal path, the endocrine path as important, but, um, there, there is always, there's always more that you could unpack, uh, 
uh, a very yeah, new reason to yield. But I'll jump in there and say that uh, all of the things that we showed tonight are absolutely things that can show up on your exam. Mm -hmm. The thing is that the likelihood that all of them show up on your exam is actually fairly small because histology isn't necessarily going to represent a majority of the questions that you end up seeing on the exam. So the trick with this type of material is to recognize what are the bread and butter things that they could ask me about? They really like showing intestinal pictures. They really like showing adrenal pictures. They really like showing cardiac myocytes. Uh, that's why we picked these things to show this evening to say, these are things that absolutely show up with a high degree of accuracy on the exam. However, it's not an exhaustive list, unfortunately, that, you know, as with anything on the step or level exams, there's just a lot of material that could go into that stuff and to talk about it all exhaustively would start to resemble some of the pathology lectures that you guys have probably fallen asleep during. So you really want to avoid that <laughs> if at all possible. So uh, suffice it to say, it's not totally exhaustive. Uh, as Mike has mentioned, there are a couple of other things that could show up on the exam, uh, namely maybe like uh, brain pictures, specifically meningiomas with somoma bodies like we had talked about at the start or technically fair game, for instance. So we would encourage you to take some of the general big picture ideas that we shared here and apply those to other things that you see in the context of your studies, but also to recognize that if any of the major organs that we went through this evening uh, were unfamiliar to you prior to this, and this was stuff that you had never seen before, these are fair game. And so those might be worth another glance, if maybe not exhaustive studying, but another glance as you're going through the material. Uh, any other questions you're seeing, Mike? Um, oh, I'll answer one actually. So question about uh, predilection for histology questions in step one compared to step two. Uh, yes, step one will have histology questions. Step two very infrequently would include histology. And if it did ever, it would always be as a conjunction to a clinical question that probably doesn't require total knowledge of the histological component to answer it correctly. So it's very much more of a step one level one thing than a step two thing or looking at the histo material. Um, also, another question is me asking, will there be more of these sessions? Um, we do these fairly regularly, these uh, evening webinars. If you have any particular interest that you'd like to see in a webinar sometime soon, uh, fill out that survey and like give some suggestions because we do take student suggestions in mind in this actual, this webinar was actually based off a student suggestion that we had gotten previously about a uh, relative weakness in histology. So uh, please uh, feel free to send us your suggestions in terms of what you'd like to see. We do these not quite weekly per se, but pretty frequently. So uh, let us know what you'd like to see in the future. All right, uh, Mike, anything else you see there? No, no, I, I think uh, I think all of that sounds good. Um, I'll, I'll echo what you said that I think that the, the histo is much more high yield for step one than step two. Um, cool, in that case then, I'm not seeing any other questions showing up. So uh, Mike, any last thoughts or ideas for our students before we close out for this evening? No, no. I mean, I, I think that, again, to the, the takeaways before, I hope this was helpful. Don't panic when you see the histo slides. You've got this. You can do it. Um, and we're here to help you along the way if, if we can. And um, and just remember, look for those path and mnemonic findings. They're, they're not trying to trick you. It's, it's a buzzword in disguise, and, and you can do it. Um, but thanks so much, guys, for joining us tonight. It was, uh, it was a blast to be able to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Really appreciate the feedback and like the participation, you guys. Uh, if you guys do show up to future webinars, whether myself or Mike are there or not, uh, we'd really appreciate you guys uh, interacting and uh, kind of staying awake during the session really makes it more, uh, hopefully helps us to direct more towards what you guys need to hear as we're going through this big picture. Uh, we wish you guys the best of luck as you continue preparing for these exams. So good luck crushing step one, level one, and step two, level two, and hopefully we'll see you guys working on the wards. All right, take care. Have a good night, everyone.